Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Geek Morning from the Escape Collective. I'm James Huang, and joining me here today, as usual, is Escape Collective technical editor Dave Rome in Sydney, Australia. Hi, Dave. Hello. Uh, and fresh off his very, very relaxing and totally sleep-filled paternity leave is our resident ultra geek go fast specialist Ronan McLaughlin from Ireland. Welcome back, Ronan. You you, you kind of got me there when you started with fresh. I was like. What, what, where's he going with us? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Who else is on this show that I can't see? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, we're, and we'll also have a, a special guest that we'll introduce later. We'll we'll save that for a little bit of a surprise. Mm. Uh, Speaking of uh, Ronan being fresh, I, I like the fact that his camera, not that anyone can see this, but his camera has a bit of like a sepia tone to it. It kind of does, actually. I was noticing <laughs> yeah. that. So it's not just me. No, uh, it's not just you. Oh, oh there, there you go. go. Uh, Refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> just a smudge. <laughs> I think that's from where I fell asleep on it earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah, I I remember those Checks days. Out. Yeah, we've mm. got uh my wife's got plenty of pictures of me asleep in very awkward body positions and locations around the house in those early days of of our kid being an infant. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. But all good. Good to be back in the show. Um, yeah, good, good, I think it's been like six you weeks or something. Uh, I I was sort of keeping notes for stuff that was on my mind that cropped up in the show over the last six weeks that I had opinions on, let's say. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we're not we're not going to. I don't I don't think we have time. Maybe take a dedicated episode. So um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, Ronan, I'll, I'll keep them to myself. Ronan, do you even know what month it is right now? Um, I know you could uh, you could quote a, a song to say "Wake me up when it ends." Um, but I don't need waking these days. I've, I've no problem getting awake. It's getting to sleep's a problem. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that made no sense. My brain's not working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, standard question for you. Latest mm. tool purchase? Uh, I spent $12 on a set of modeling files because I came across uh, a very... I came across, uh, I was working on a, uh, someone's Focus, uh, which had been sweated on greatly as an indoor training bike to the point that the cables had uh, become one with the frame. Ooh. And the, the, the ferrules had gotten stuck in their cable stops, external cable routing, uh, and I, I had to file them out. But because like the way the, the head tube sits wider than the cable stop, the, the angle is very, very awkward. Um, so I now have like angled files. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a it was a interesting kind of fun job, but uh, yeah. Anyway, twelve dollars, and hopefully those will come in handy the next the next time. I I bought tools. What? Oh, what? I bought are they bicycle. To, I, are they bicycle related? I mean, you could do a lot of damage to a bicycle with some of them. <laughs> I I bought a circular saw, a jigsaw, a thicknesser and planer combo unit. I bought uh, hammers, chisels, standard saws. The, the, I... This sounds like a bunch of tools you shouldn't be using with sleep, sleep decoration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. These are... Uh, I, I, I decided that I finally needed to finish my garage that i built a couple of years ago because there is no space in the house for working at the moment with two kids um so i went pricing like kitchen units to try and finish it and quickly came to the conclusion that for a quarter of the price of the kitchen units has been quoted i could buy all the materials and timber and tools which is the main part and build it myself i think mm. so that's ambitious I- have you gotten to the mm. point where you're regretting that decision yet? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think as soon as I walked out of the store. What what was the brand <laughs> of tools you bought? Um I'm unfortunately uh wasn't aware of the errors of my way when I was building the the garage a few years back and I invested in a couple of DeWalt tools. Oh. And now I'm locked into DeWalt uh, oh, in terms right. of cardless power tools oh that's Good that's tools, it's but, higher end than i than i thought you would say uh well let me finish in that good tools but um not not budget friendly um, yeah sure and so i have um and we discussed this briefly this morning dave but i've had to uh commit to some parkside tools for 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 tools that i 
I'm not going to be using all that often once this project is done because I was able to buy all the tools and different batteries for mm. less than the price of yeah. one of the DeWalt options. Yeah. So um as as we found out last night when I was looking up uh Parkside tools, uh the official tool uh as used by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Absolutely no money exchange hands there. He just he just seems to be <laughs> want to be an ambassador in all their videos. Oh my. Presumably also the the official tools of the little track team going forward. Um oh, okay. given their new sponsor. Oh wow. Uh, uh, James, if you're not aware, Parkside is Little's own brand Metal oh, Idol. Oh. Almost uh, it, Harbor Freight tools. kind of, but being little and being the EU, I would say they uh they have much more stringent uh, uh standards applied and probably far fewer recalls. Hmm. What could go wrong? Just mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, similar to my upcoming test of my twenty dollar S Works Power Carbon knockoff AliExpress saddle. What could go well, wrong? If should you happen to need that uh, disposed of or destroyed, uh, you can send it over. I've got all the tools required. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we've got a pretty big pile of tech stuff to get through today on today's show. Uh, we've got a brand new Roubaix endurance road bike from Specialized. We've got a new Defy endurance road bike from Giant. We've got a pair of new indoor stationary trainers from Wahoo. Some news from Zwift. Uh, yet more interesting little 3D printed titanium doodads from Silka. Um, uh, and assuming we can get to it, we'll hopefully talk about, uh, an intriguing new virtual test lab setup from MIPS. Uh, so, you know, since we've got a big old list, let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, first up, we've got this new specialized Roubaix SL8, which, uh, if I recall correctly, there was no official Roubaix SL7 was there. So this is kind of a new nomenclature here. Um, mm. but anyway, uh, big news is Specialized has revised their Future Shock front suspension setup yet again. Three point uh, oh. Three point. Well, it's it's three point oh, but it, there's there's three point one, three point two, and three point three already. So oh, wow. uh, it's yeah, it's still it's still built into the top of the steer tube in like this little separate cartridge. Uh, it's still twenty millimeters of travel, but there are now three different ones depending on what version of bike you get. Um, the top end Future Shock 3.3, it's hydraulically damped and it has adjustable on the fly compression damping. Uh, Future Shock 3.2, uh, still hydraulically damped, but it's non adjustable on the fly. And then the 3.1 version is basically just a spring. Um, and, it, and, it, and as you push down on it, it says, You're poor. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, big, no. big, big news, no, though, I, however, I is that. Uh, I mean, I would argue that this should have been introduced quite a long time ago, but uh, you can now actually swap out the spring rates on the Future Shock to you know your preference and or body weight, which is or, or and or position on the bike, which is I think a pretty big deal and something that's long, long, long overdue. Yeah, um, a big deal, then, much needed, but also one of those things that it's like, why hasn't that been there all along? Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that we have been asking that question for quite some time mm -hmm. and never really got great answers with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, at least it's fixed now. Better late than never, I guess. Um, I don't, however, know if those future shock cartridges can be retrofitted to older Roubaix because that would be pretty interesting. Uh, I certainly have heard from some people who have particularly aggressive positions on their Roubaix and basically just bottom out their cartridge already just by sitting on the bike and having their hands on the hoods or the drops. Um, mm. So in the event that those cartridges can be retrofitted for anyone who has been dealing with that issue, that would be good to know. Um, out back, there's not really a whole lot changed uh, as far as comfort related features on the Roubaix. Um, you have a lowered seat post clamp and a bunch of empty space on the backside of the or kind of like on the inside of the backside of the seat tube so that the seat post can flex a whole lot. Um, tire clamps for 40 mil tires, uh, actual width, 30 or 35 mil with fenders. You've got some aero tube shaping, it's carbon fiber, of course, uh, specializes claiming that a uh, 56 centimeter frame weighs 828 grams, uh, which is apparently 50 grams lighter than before. That's just for the frame only. It's certainly not, not including that future shot cartridge. Uh, top end S Works model is supposedly 7.3 kilos, which is pretty light. A uh, bunch of mounts. You got front front and rear fender mounts, top tube bag mounts, three bottle mounts, 
Uh, one interesting little tidbit, the front rotor, uh, well, the front caliper mount is sized for 180 or 160 millimeter rotors instead of the usual 160, 140, which I think is actually something that a lot more bikes should be doing. Um, and then this thing's also going to be available as a frame set, but prices for complete bikes start at 2,800 US, uh, 3,900 Australian, 2,500 British pounds, 2,800 euros, and it goes all the way up to 14,000 US. 19.9 Australian, 12,000 pounds or 14,000 euros. So that's a pretty big spread. Indeed. A lot of tire clearance on this one. Yeah, it's pretty good, I think. Uh, I just, I, I find it particularly interesting how those lines between endurance road bikes are blurring more and more uh, to gravel bikes because it really wasn't that long ago that gravel bikes had clearance for 35s. And now that's what you get with a tarmac. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely uh, increasingly confusing for the customer that's gravel curious that kind of thinks they want a road bike but is kind of intrigued by gravel. It's like, do you go a bike like this or do you go a, a racier gravel bike like a a Crux or a Cervelo Sparrow or something like that? It's it's definitely, as you said, the lines are blurred. But uh, yeah, I mean, pricing aside, the bike looks pretty good. And I have to say, like, I've always been... I've always been a little torn on this model because I love the geometry. I find that I think the their stack and reach figures are are really good for the intended market. I think that that very high stack is actually exactly what quite a few customers in the market need and are not well served by by a lot of other brands. Um, but then there's also the complexity, the cost, and and the weight of of the future shock that I'm I'm still not entirely sold on. I think I'd be more uh more in love with it if it were more serviceable yeah i mean it's you know we were talking offline just before we started recording um you know specialized has long touted that the cartridge itself is serviceable however it doesn't really seem that the t required tools or the parts are really all that readily available at all um it's definitely replaceable it is replaceable. I mean, one thing that Specialized mentioned is that the uh, the new cartridges are apparently better sealed than the old ones. Gotcha. Um, so that's certainly an improvement, but a uh, question about serviceability kind of is still unanswered at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a lot to like about this bike. Obviously, it's you have to pay for it. It's it's not uh, certainly not a cheap option, but uh, yeah, I don't know. There's still... I think they finally got there with the Future Shock in terms of giving it the features it needs, but uh, third generation lucky, I guess. I'm I'm kind of curious where the SLA part of it comes in. Um, it, my uh, guess is one of the first questions I had when I seen the new bike. Well, one of the first questions I had when I seen the new bike was, "Am I looking at the new Roubaix or am I looking at the old Roubaix?" Um, because visually, um, if I think they're very, very similar, aren't they? <laughs> you guys are looking at me like I've missed something, but I think they're... Mate, they're they should have pretty... given it a speed sniffer. But uh, yeah, I think... Well, that, that, no, joking aside, that was actually what I was going to ask, was like, if that is so revolutionary on the SL8, and this is the SL8 Roubaix, mm. I, I, maybe it's something to do with the Future Shock. I can't think what, given where the Future Shock is, but why is that not carried across? Like, the, this new bike is 17 seconds faster over... 100k or 100 miles 100k i think which i don't know but if i was on a bike like this i'd i'm pretty sure i, don't know, I was riding 100k i'm pretty sure i wouldn't be doing it for speed uh i might even have a couple of stops in there so 17 seconds probably isn't going to make all that big a difference to me um yep. yeah you're gonna spend this... you're gonna spend if you're on this type, type of bike you're more likely to optimize your time spent at the cafe than <laughs> to worry about the 17 seconds on the road yeah uh, i mean i mean like it, it is the uh, i think the difficulty for me with the 17 seconds over 100k it's like it's yet another way to measure an aerodynamic gain and mm. it might have been better just not to mention it and say you know what it kind of yeah. we have streamlined it or whatever like we, we i don't think we really needed the 17 seconds over 100k measurement I mean, ultimately, we know what the game is here, right? Like it, it is, it, it is all in the marketing, right? Mm. Because aside from 
what I think will be very tangible and good improvements in that future shot cartridge. Yeah. The reality is the 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 previous generation Roubaix is already a really good bike, and ultimately, if you want someone to to feel like they should or need to buy the new one, then you sort of just have to pile on as many of what you feel are compelling arguments to, to do so, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it be lighter or more comfortable or more aero or more red or, you know, sparklier or whatever, like, yeah, like that, that's the name of the game here, right? Yeah. And, and I think the Roubaix in recent years has had probably an image issue. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people that want an S works want to want the cool one. Want they want the tarmac or they want the Athos and they want to be seen as like perhaps a little bit of a you know the racer in them. And the Roubaix doesn't really have that. It's kind of you know being an endurance bike. It's kind of that old man bike. Uh, and I think them putting the SL8, uh, them putting the SL8 branding on it. Uh, I think, and and saying it's 17 seconds or whatever is is proving to everyone that it is actually a race bike. I just want to address the elephant in the room here internally yeah. because uh, people listening to the podcast may or may not have noticed that we do not have an article on this new Roubaix SL8 on escapecollective.com. And a big part of that is that for whatever reason, uh, we didn't go to this launch. Uh, we actually didn't really know about it until pretty late in the game. And we don't have one in for test. Uh, and Dave, I will say that you calling the Roubaix an old man bike is probably not helping that case for whatever reason we didn't get invited. Right. Well, I'm, I'm sniggering here because Dave, uh, I've already I told Dave earlier. comment about another brand in the past. <laughs> earlier today, how I had to put up with uh, a lot of kickback from another brand for Dave uh, referring to their new bike as an old man bike uh, and the brand mistakenly thinking it was me that had said that uh, when actually it, it, was, it wasn't so when I said it there again I didn't know if he was uh, yeah it wasn't, trying to get me a more baller it wasn't I, I would I'm not I'm not singling out any one brand with that I would say the entire endurance category was historically marketed to to older men uh, and that is why so many brands no longer call them endurance bikes they now call them all road bikes is because they're trying to to move away from that image uh but yeah i mean effectively that's still who it's aimed at right it's still aimed at the rider that can't comfortably use a lower stack and reach position which is arguably most people uh but yeah i don't know i, I stand by that i i don't think it's a specific thing to to roubaix but i i do think that's the effectively the target market yeah and i have a lot of difficulty with the sort of uh one on sunday buy on or sell on monday sort of idea um marketing idea that obviously came from automotive and motorsport but it's very much what we see in cycling also and that you know a lot of a lot of us tend to want the bike that you know, Pogaccia is running with on a Sunday afternoon or whatever it might be. And more often than not, it's a bike like the category that the Roubaix sits in that would Absolutely. actually suit a lot of us a lot, yes. lot better. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, except one Sunday in April per year, we don't see these bikes on our TV screens. And yeah. as such, yeah, they, they're they harder to market to. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's exactly audience. my point as to why this has that SL8 branding added to it now is that that, it tells everyone it is a race bike and it's aligned to the, you know, it's an equivalent to the new tarmac basically, as far as, you know, specializer pitching it, it's just a more comfortable bike. Um, I, I truly believe it is the better bike for, for the vast majority of people. Like every, every weekend I'm out on the roads and I see people on tarmacs or Athoses with the maximum amount of stack, uh, stack height in the spaces. Uh, and even then they're still probably too low on that bike. Uh, and, a bike like the Roubaix solves that, and yeah, if you if you're having to run the maximum number of stack on a race bike, it's probably not the best bike for you. Uh, that all being said, uh, regardless of marketing spin or kind of incremental improvements over the previous generation or however you want to look at this thing, there is not a doubt in my mind that Specialized is going to sell an absolute bucket load of these things. Yeah, I. I, I think they'll sell a bunch of them, but I I think I could be mistaken on this. I, I have no insight into into their their sales, but I know the Roubaix, say ten years ago, was their best selling model uh, because it was the same across every brand. The Trek Demane was Trek's best selling road bike. 
uh, the Giant Defy was Giant's best selling, and it was just because the the mass population were buying endurance road bikes, uh, and they used to have the riders use them in more than one race a year as well. Uh, these days, I'm I'm not convinced that the endurance category is as successful. I think it's really been eroded by by gravel bike sales. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, uh, and it also I, probably doesn't help that now that one race per year, the, a lot of the riders aren't even using this yes, option anymore. Yeah, because the general race bikes become so capable. But mm. yeah, um, but yeah. Anyway, I, I, I'm sure they will sell a bunch of these, but I'm I'm not quite sure it's as successful or as important of a of a category as perhaps it was a decade ago. One thing I'm not sure if you mentioned there, James, or not, but I, if you didn't mention, I'm going to have to pull you up on it because this bike has. Well, for the most part, it has externally rooted hoses here. So um, I know you tend to not like them when they're internal. So you're going to have to <laughs> mention when they're uh, not. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. I did not mention that. You are absolutely correct. And I, I, although I think my guess is the reason why it is not fully internally routed or hidden is just because of that future shock element. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't see how they could have done that. Hmm. Uh, if they had a speed sniffer, it would have given room for it. <laughs> so uh future shock 4.0 will be internally routed with a speed sniffer mm. there you go you heard it here uh, first i still can't believe that's the official name for that thing speed sniffer uh, i like it i like that they have some humor with it it uh i was gonna say it might have been a hose gobbler if it actually ran the cables through it rather than uh, a speed hose sniffer gobbler. yes <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness ah all right anyway uh we hopefully will have one of these on hand at some point for an actual review uh but in the meantime that's the rundown on that so we'll see how this thing goes um in other new uh in other news in the endurance road bike front we have a new defy from giant uh, this one's pretty different, uh, maybe not entirely surprising. So basically, since Giant had launched the Defy in, what, 2008 or something like that, um, Giant's been pretty conservative with the Defy, I would say. And I think Giant's fairly conservative overall. Um, you know, they've never incorporated any sort of complex suspension element, and they've kind of leaned more on just the the idea of just, you know, getting more compliance out of the whole system. Um so what we have now, we've got a uh, carbon fiber seat post and handlebar. It still uses that D-shaped profile that Giant introduced uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, the seat post now has this big cutout on the backside of it to improve the flex even more. Uh, tires are still, well, the stock tires are still 32 millimeters wide as far as the printed width goes. The actual width is actually close to the 34. Um, and then the... Uh, Tire clearance bumps up to, I think, 38, I believe. Uh, but one big piece of news is that it's quite a bit lighter. So uh, after a little bit of a hiatus, we now have a Defy Advanced SL version again. Uh, and the yeah, and the claimed frame weight on that one for a medium, uh, for a medium unpainted frame is 785 grams, which is pretty impressive. Uh, I think I haven't seen this bike because we're recording this before it's uh, the embargo is lifted. And James, you've been very secretive about this. Uh, but what you've just said to me tells me that uh, Giant have perhaps just filled a gap, a very much needed gap in the market, which is a lightweight endurance road bike, uh, which when you look through the options in the market, it's it's very scarce at the moment for, for exactly that. Trek de Mane, Specialized Roubaix, very good endurance road bikes, but neither are particularly light at any set price point. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if Giant's basically able to hit that seven-ish kilo mark, I suspect they're going to sell a bunch of these. Uh, they are actually. So for the actual weight for the small-sized flagship model that I have with SRAM Red, uh, shallow-ish profile, KDX carbon spoked wheels, all the fancy carbon fiber goodies, uh, it's seven point oh seven kilos without any pedals or accessories. So that's pretty darn good. Yeah, because my my experience with this category is that a lot of these customers say riders in their 60s even 70s uh they are still riding there's a quite a lot of, lot of people that are still riding rim brake bikes and they haven't felt the need to upgrade their road bikes they don't care about riding off road i'm speaking of sydney riders at the moment like an older group of sydney riders uh but they don't care for going off road they just want a road bike but they're used to a rim brake road bike which is probably seven ish kilos and every disc brake road bike they've looked at feels too heavy they don't care about aerodynamics they don't care about all the extra comfort features like the Future Shock. They just want a simple road bike like they have now, but with disc brakes and without added weight. 
Uh, and it sounds like that might be coming. Yeah, I mean, in that in that sense, I think Giant really has had a pretty good finger on the pulse of what a lot of those people want because, mm. again, there's no like moving parts, and you don't have you know Future Shock, you don't have ISO speed, you don't have all these things that a lot of people kind of take issue with. Uh, when you look at it, it basically does just look like essentially just a regular road racing bike, except with um, you know, like the handling actually isn't even all that toned down. Like the trail figures are still in the sixties. Yeah, great. Um, and then the fits are slightly more upright, but not very upright at all. Uh, you can still get fairly aggressive on the thing, but the big thing is that you just have a lot of flex in the seat post and handlebar. Um, it's light, uh, giant does not, absolutely does not make any big deal at all about any sort of aerodynamic features. And you have a bunch of tire clearance if you want it, but you don't have to use it. Of course. James, you mentioned looks there a couple of times and uh, uh, Dave you haven't seen the bike yet but I, I just got a look at it tonight James sent it across this is I think they've made this one heck of a good looking bike also which is you know obviously very important uh, I think it's a big update or upgrade or whatever you want to call it from the previous Defy and I always felt to me like it was a bit I don't know there's something about the design of it that it, the front didn't match the rear of the frame or the front seemed much much chunkier and the rear seemed very low profile and yeah just never really melded together all that well for me um but going back to the Rebay for a second Dave you mentioned that the the stack and reach figures there are kind of you thought that was a, a really good offering personally I'm more inclined to lean towards what the Defy is offering here I think if the, the Defy you know it's obviously higher and, and shorter than a TCR or something like that but it's not as high as a Rebay and when something is as high as a Rubé, you, you you can't come down if that's what you need. If you need to go lower, it's, it's not possible. Whereas where the Defy sits, in, in my opinion only, you can chuck a few spacers underneath and it doesn't look terrible if you need that higher position. Yeah, But uh, it also, for, for a position that I would like, it's still achievable on that bike. Yeah, I think, I think for a lot of riders, the Defy kind of geometry makes a lot of sense and it's probably that little bit more relaxed than say like a Savelli Caledonia or a BMC Road Machine again, which are, are still fairly racy uh but from what i've seen out there and again speaking this like 60 to 70 category i'm i'm thinking like my father and and a lot of the people he rides with uh they are basically still sticking with like the maximum stack on like a roubaix or a demane um so something like a giant defy they're then probably having to figure out how to flip the stem um so yeah it's there there are there are a large group of people out there that that basically need the handlebars level to the saddle yeah so about that stem mm. by the way so one mm -hmm. thing i am not super stoked about with this bike um I, I gave giant a lot of props when the current generation tcr came out because they i would say pretty boldly went with uh external cabling outside of the head tube up front yeah um with this defy they've basically adopted the system that they use on the propel which is that d-shaped steer tube and then uh, a, a stem where the hoses run along the underneath, uh, or along the underside, and then it kind of takes that downward turn through the spacers, through the headset, uh, upper headset bearings, that sort of thing. Um, it does clean it up, sure. Uh, I'm still not a fan of it. Uh, you can at least swap stems without a huge amount of issue. Uh, you can raise and lower it at, I don't know, what, like 20, 30 millimeters or whatever. I can't remember what the exact number is. Um, but as far as big changes in height or swapping to another stem that is just not possible right now they do have three different stems that you can use and i think one of them you can flip upward um but because of that d-shaped steer tube it is a proprietary setup right now uh so even if you did have another kind of like nominally inch and a quarter diameter stem that you were looking to stick on there you can't put it on there and actually interestingly enough giant's own cadex stems uh that they really intend for the aftermarket that doesn't fit on here either Oh no. Yeah, right. Okay. So it sounds like there's probably some opportunity for aftermarket stems with this bike. I think uh for anyone who it, it decides might take a while. That, yeah, but for anyone who decides that there's a big enough market for that anyway. Yeah. Um so I don't know, between the Defy and the Propel, now that the now that both of those families have gone to this steer tube shape, maybe there'll be enough of a a, a volume for a, a third party to come in and offer an aftermarket stem, but uh, in the meantime, as at least as of right now, I'm not aware of any aftermarket options. Yeah, okay. Well, um, slight, slightly related, but uh, do you find it amusing that both Specialized and Giant, after years of 
not really paying attention to their endurance bikes have all of a sudden both released new endurance bikes in the same almost on the same day like within two days of each other yeah i mean it's it is pretty amusing for sure um yeah it's it's kind of tricky to look at the landscape of drop bar bikes right now because without question gravel bikes are where the bulk of the attention is it's where the bulk of the interest is i mean because ultimately what i keep hearing from people over and over again is that they are looking to get off the road get away from cars uh that seems to be their primary motivation um i think road racing bikes are still interesting from almost kind of like a sporting formula one sort of thing almost more like an observational sort of thing or like you just kind of want that you kind of want to like want to be part of that image um but for more casual riders you know, endurance road bikes, especially the ones that are out now with all that tire clearance, it's probably about as kind of dedicated road racing as a lot of people are willing to go now. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, a lot of people are going to be focusing their attention now on gravel just because, again, they want to get away from traffic. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. I, I made there was quite a few builders that were saying they're seeing a resurgence of, of road bike orders, uh, which, yeah, I suddenly around Sydney road is still massively popular and again in melbourne you know like there's still sections uh countries and and regions where road is still very much the in the in thing um but yeah it's it's an interesting category that's for sure yeah and and the 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 sad reality is i shouldn't even say sad reality reality but just the reality is you know gravel riding is super dependent on what sort of terrain you have available to you um so I would say if you're in a more urban environment, you are far more likely to have a bunch of paved options uh, at your disposal as opposed to a bunch of unpaved gravel, dirt, whatever. Um, and the fact of the matter is for as many times as you hear someone say like, oh, this gravel bike feels as fast as a road bike, blah, blah, blah. That's a bunch of crap. Like dedicated road bikes still are and still do feel faster than any gravel bike. Um, and like this bike, this Defy, for example, for as speedy as it is and as light as it is with these kind of 32, 34 mil tires and as light as it is, whatever, it's still not going to be as fast or feel as fast as like a six kilo or six and a half kilo dedicated aero road racing bike that like that's just going to go faster on tarmac. All right. Uh, moving back to outdoor riding. Um, so Silka... Uh, it's a company that a whole lot of people are going to be familiar with in terms of like they'll think of tires and inflation and that sort of thing. Um, but they've been moving kind of deeper and deeper into this 3D printed titanium space. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they need to pay for those 3D titanium printers that they bought. Uh, so their latest widget that they have brought out are uh, a bunch of 3D printed titanium derailleur hangers that they are claiming offers, quote, increased strength and stiffness, improved shifting speed, uh, unquote, and yet uh, it's about 2 to 12 grams lighter than stock aluminum hangers. Uh, there's nine brands supported, uh, plus plus uh, standard and direct mount for UDH. Um, and then there is, still, for pe- people who are worried about frame damage, they are still including what, uh, what Josh Portner is talking about uh, or has described as a fracture notch. Uh, and then just by virtue of all like the little extra little... Uh, sort of like wavy tethered bits that are on the interior, uh, kind of like the webbing that's on the inside of that thing. Um, they are saying that even if it does break, your derailleur is still going to be kind of attached on there. So it presumably is not going to go like flying into your spokes. Kind of like a crumple zone of a car almost, the the gyro kind infill, of. the print infill that they're using, I guess. It kind of just, yeah, it'll it'll crumple together rather than yeah. snap yeah. off. So... Um, this is interesting to me because this isn't exactly a new thing. Um, so I remember way, way back, um, I mean, this would be 15-ish years ago or something. I think it was Wheels Manufacturer, uh, Wheels Manufacturing. They were actually making custom titanium hangers for Cervelo for a while, at least for the team. Um, and all of that was presumably to improve shift performance. But, um, you know, pro teams, at least anyway, when your bike falls over, they don't necessarily want the derailleur hanger to bend all that easily. Um, so they would prefer to have it be a little bit more likely that your bike is going to be, you know, it's still able to be ridden. Um, you know, as opposed to having the derailleur hanger bend in pretty easily, which I think uh, we've kind of maybe moved too far into having that sacrificial bit be pretty bendy. Um, 
I find these intriguing. So they're, they're definitely expensive. They're like eighty-five to one hundred dollars U.S. So absolutely not inexpensive by any means. Um, but as we are packing more and more sprockets into a cassette, um, as tolerances get tighter and tighter, you know, even with electronic, or I, I would almost say, especially with electronic, with the how much power is going through those servo motors and separate motors and that sort of thing, um, it is pretty important to have a firm foundation for that derailleur. Um, like a lot of people are writing that thing off as being pretty pretty dumb. Uh, I don't actually think it's all that dumb. No, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, it it for me it makes a lot of sense if you're on a Shimano or a newer Campy drivetrain where the like that you can use the direct mount style hanger and you can eliminate the the little what do they call it B link um, that sits between your regular derailleur hanger and the the main bolt of the derailleur. Um, there is actually a, a benefit there in terms of gaining shift stiffness and shift responsiveness by by eliminating that piece. Uh, and you can feel it when you when you do eliminate it. So uh, in that sense, I think Silker have created something that's quite cool here. Um, they're not the only ones to do it, but they're obviously the only ones to do it in uh, a cool hollow-ish looking 3D printed style, which has, yeah, the benefit of that, that crumple zone that they say won't, you know, will give way to save the the axle or the frame, but not uh, not give way so much that you lose your wheel in the process. Yeah, and I actually asked Josh about the whole, you know, the argument that you're just kind of promoting frame damage. And one thing that he pointed out that I actually hadn't really thought of that much was um, because there's so much better dropout support nowadays with through axle setups as opposed to the quick releases of yesteryear, um, it's it'd be pretty hard to damage a dropout in a crash like that. Um, so I think probably the issue, or I guess the question still is, you know, are you going to damage your derailleur instead of damaging your hanger? And that, that's certainly a valid question. Um, it seems less likely with modern electronic stuff because a lot yeah. of those have breakaway features. Um, uh, it might be a problem if you're running like a, like a super lightweight, can't be mechanical rear derailleur or like a Shimano Dura Ace mechanical rear derailleur or something like that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I don't really see a whole lot of downside to making a stiffer hanger. And if anything, I think most of them are too flimsy now. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, these are only for newer disc brake bikes. So it's like newer models from Can yes. Cannondale, Cervelo, Factor, Specialized, Scott, Trek, Canyon, and Pinarello. Uh, so yeah, only only newer disc brake bikes using through axles um, or using a, the UDH. Um, so yeah, it's a limited selection for for popular bikes. But but yeah, I think it's it's a nice little upgrade. Um, and aesthetically, I think it'll look really nice with an OSPW. Oh geez, <laughs> just piling on the <laughs> piling on the bill there, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I so, don't know. In my mind, the person buying this might already have the OSPW, so it's uh, just a, yeah. it's just a, an addition. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it looks like you can act. You know, it, aesthetically, it's it's a very obvious, obviously that you've bought a silica titanium piece. You know, it has a very unique aesthetic. So I don't know if I love that element, but some people will. Can I can I get it in custom anodized colors? Uh, you could polish it and custom anodize it yourself, James. Hmm, that sounds like a lot of work. Would, would the ultimate flex be to get this and then hide it inside like a tiny piece of inner tube that keeps yes. your DI2 wire in yes, place? Yes, that would be the ultimate flex. Or the ultimate flex would be to buy one and just not use it. Just like, eh, you know, I bought it a year ago. It's just sitting in my workbench. <laughs> Key ring fob. <laughs> <laughs> carry it carry it around in your saddlebag as a spare yeah use it as a bottle opener excellent yes yeah. yes yes all right uh next bit of news we're now in mid-september on the calendar year and there's probably a fair bit of people at least in the northern hemisphere uh maybe starting to think about indoor riding season uh wahoo has just released two new trainers this week uh the kicker move and the kicker bike shift so um Actually, to help us discuss these new indoor trainers, we've actually brought in a special guest. We've got Shane Miller, a.k.a. GP Llama. Uh, Shane, welcome to Geek Warning. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me on. It's an exciting time. Some new things on the indoor scene. Uh, I'm quite happy to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's go ahead and talk about it. What is the kicker? Well, actually, do you want to talk about the kicker move first or the kicker bike? Yeah, look, overall, what we've got is, I'd say there's three announcements from Wahoo we need to discuss here because they're playing sort of all ends of the spectrum. With the recent price drops at the Kicker Core, they're addressing the lower end. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Kicker Move, which is the new premium offering. 
which goes back and forward. And we've got something people have been asking for is a cheaper indoor bike. This one doesn't go up and down, but the performance is still pretty good. So I'd say there's three things to talk about here um, that addresses all ends. Well, let's let's start at the bottom. Well, uh, let's let's start with the kicker core. What do we got here? Kicker core down to five ninety nine US, which is extremely competitive. The kicker core has been a uh, two thousand and eighteen, I think it was released, and has done super super well because it provides pretty much what people want: jump on, a little bit of resistance, bit of simulation, and they can get a good workout done. Might not have the killer accuracy, doesn't have the, well, you can add the up and down to it on the front if you like, but it does pretty much what everyone wants. And there's a lot of attention now at the lower end, especially with the Zwift Hub um, changing the game at the $4.99 price point. Uh, and also, you know, everyone dropping their prices at the lower end. So Wahoo have addressed that, which is good to see lately. So no changes to that since its introduction, like in, as you say, like five years ago? Yeah, I think the kicker cores remain the same. I, it's Quite not remarkable. a recalibration. Yeah. I think they added um, cadence later on, maybe yeah. dual Bluetooth, but pretty much it serves everything people want uh, at the mm. lower end anyway, it does. Well, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, at that end of the market for exactly, as you said, Shane, for a lot of people riding indoors, like it does what people want it to do. And it doesn't really need a whole bunch of flashy bits and added features and stuff like that if it just gets the if it just gets the job done and now costs less that's probably the most important thing at that range of the market yeah my, my biggest criticism of that trainer is that it's it's a workout in itself to to pick up and move and step away because <laughs> there's no handle Agreed. on it Agreed. so uh but yeah otherwise uh yeah i mean i've i've used one quite a bit and yeah, it's a solid product cool uh well uh moving upward from from there i guess let's talk about this new kicker move so i i want to point out uh Wahoo is one of those companies that loves deleting vowels. And for whatever reason, this is the kicker, K-I-C-K-R, just as they've always spelled kicker. But they've actually spelled that move, like M-O-V-E. Like it's not like M-U umlaut V or M, like it's not just M-V, isn't it? Like kicker move. Yeah, kicker anyway. Maui, kicker moo, kicker moo wouldn't have been, uh, no, they've actually stuck with it. And uh, yeah, this does address the premium level. So let's be, uh, let's be clear here, this thing is expensive. Coming in at, well, in Aussie dollars, it's uh, $2,500, which is a little bit up. I think in the US market, I think it's only around $300 more than what the standard kicker goes for. But another yep. important thing yep. is this doesn't replace the kicker. Wahoo have traditionally replaced the kicker every year and called it the kicker. Like what we've seen today, there's a new iPhone. It's just the iPhone. Well, it does have a number to it, but Wahoo haven't replaced the kicker six. So this is in addition to. So a lot of people are are angry about the price rise and they don't want the movement. That's okay. It's kind of like sitting around in our Toyotas talking about the new price of Porsche. Uh, you, know, it's, uh, <laughs> you don't have to choose this one. So it's in addition to premium level, moves back and forward. That's the biggest, uh, the biggest difference with this. Other than that, I've called it a kicker six on rails or it's the monorail kicker six. But yeah, but, but that's about it. I mean, yep. it's, not, it, it's not anything super revolutionary. So yeah, it has a eight inch or roughly 20 centimeter of forward, four and a half movement on yep. like a pretty fluid feeling little cradle. So you don't need a separate rocker table or anything like that. Um, you know, Wahoo is saying that you have a little bit more side to side tilt than you did before, even though it's the same axis feet. Um, otherwise it, yeah, it is basically just a kicker six. That's right. Yep. Shane, you've, you've ridden this, right? Absolutely. Well, I, I've watched, I watched your video today. I know you've ridden it. Yeah. I don't know why I asked that. Anyway, what I want to ask you is, do we want movement in this way? I, I noticed it wasn't great when you tried to do it sprint on it or it wasn't yeah it? absolutely look I've, I've covered rocker plates i've covered rocker plates extensively in the past and for me rocker plates are a bit of a no-go because of out of the saddle out of the saddle the bike slops the wrong way and i've shown this when riding a skateboard it's probably the best similar analogy i can use when you're riding a skateboard if you stand there on a skateboard static not moving and you rock side to side that's one type of movement but if you do that same side to side rocking while you're moving forward on a skateboard it's an entirely different experience and it's the same with rocker plates they add a little bit of Movement, it, it just takes the pressure points, no, the stress off the pressure points, I guess. And that's a welcome change. Not a game changer for me. It's a welcome change, uh, except as you saw in my video there, when you're sprinting, the thing does rock around and you start fighting it moving forward and back. But the, uh, the move does have a little quick lockout that you can just tap with your foot, locks things out and becomes rock solid. But you're not buying one of these to lock it out. Um, so yeah, it, it's, almost, it's almost too fluid. The movement back and forward? Yeah. Yeah, they've tried to address that by making it a bit of a, a U shape or a V shape. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. further you go, the harder it gets to sort of ramp up, I guess. But in doing that, you also get a bit of wish wash effect or a bit of back wash as you go forward and back. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but that slight amount of movement is welcome. Uh, I haven't ridden one, but uh, would you say someone hypersensitive to, to car sickness might not enjoy this? 
Someone brought that up in the comments. They said, uh, yeah, it might take some ginger before, uh, or eat some ginger before <laughs> using this because of the motion sickness. And that's a good question. If you do have a big screen in front of you, a lot of people do like the, you know, the, the premium setups, the immersiveness of these new 3D worlds. And if you're too close to it, you're moving forward and back, that could be an issue for some people for sure. Yeah, like I'm someone I'm someone that had to has had to leave an IMAX in the past, uh, mid-movie. So... Um, yeah, it's been many years, but yeah, certainly I'm susceptible. So I'm I'm questioning whether this is the right product for me. But anyway, <laughs> depends how comfortable the seat was in IMAX. <laughs> there's that rolling hell section on Watopia that always makes me feel a bit uh, queasy or something. I don't know. I, I'm just thinking if you were doing a full gas out of the saddle, back and forth, and up and down, and the screen's going and Titans yeah. Grove in a bunch that's moving very very fast can be a bit of a roller coaster for sure. Look, it does depend. It's it's quite subjective as well on your pedal stroke. Uh, if you're in erg mode, it will hardly move, but you've also got to be very very smooth. Um, so uh, the horses for courses, it really does depend. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, I do, I am, I do like that Wahoo introduced the kicker move in addition to the mm -hmm. V6 yes, as absolutely. opposed to it in, as a replacement, as you mentioned earlier, Shane. Um, so I think. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I, I certainly don't think this is going to replace the V6 for a lot of people. Um, but I think for people who have been considering a higher end stationary trainer, then this is probably something that they will consider. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to cannibalize sales of the V6 that much. Silly question from someone that hasn't actually seen the product yet. Uh, can you upgrade a, a V6 to have this feature or is it built in? Nope. Yeah, it's a it's, total redesign of the feet. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. it's a complete it's a completely different frame if I'm remembering correct if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. Okay. Um, well, that and even if it was technically upgradable, it's not really in Wahoo's interest from a business standpoint to make it upgradable. Like they sure. really just want you to buy the trainer. Gotcha. Um, all right. Well, uh, moving up the scale even more. So now we have a kicker bike shift. Um, which is a little bit of a confusing name because we still like sort of like how we now have the kicker move in addition to the regular kicker. Uh, this kicker bike shift is in addition to the uh, existing kicker bike, um, but instead of being an upgrade over it, this one's actually a, a lower cost one. So what are we looking at here, Shane? Yeah, well, well, not a lot of people were asking for a more expensive kicker. A lot of people were asking nope. for a cheaper kicker bike, and this addresses that, so it's a good thing. They are listening. Uh, no tilts on this one, which reduces... A lot of things, the weight, the cost, the creaking, the, the overhead. Yeah, there's a lot of involved <laughs> in just having that thing tilt up and down, the kicker bike that is. So that's now gone from this unit, or not a feature of this unit. A different resistance unit. This is an electromagnetic brake. It doesn't have a drive motor on the kicker bike. So it's actually quieter than the kicker bike. Uh, good ride feel, virtual gears. You can smash through the gears, full power. Um, nothing slips, uh, nothing jumps. Uh, what else? Uh, they've adjusted the top tube. It's a little thinner. Now I have, being a time trial, I'm trying to get thin and as, you know, as close as possible and as aero as possible, even indoors. And I have thigh rub issues on some of these bikes. That's now thinner. So it well, it's, a, it's a steel frame now. Yeah, yeah. Steel frame rather than an alloy frame. Um, but riding it doesn't really feel that much different. It doesn't, could be carbon. It could be anything. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't go anywhere. But there is a bit of flex to it, which is welcome. It's not what I've called in my video, a brick fence with a set of handlebars on it, which we do find with a lot of spin type bikes that they do not move at all. This thing has a little bit of flex, so it's not too bad for sprinting. I I read the Kicker V2 bike or bike V2, whatever, whatever it's called. Um, and not the flex that you mentioned there, but I found that the... The there was there was the the the, bike, the the frame was not the frame but just the way the handlebars go into the top tube and the seat post uh, joints to the top tube um, that I could basically if I sprinted hard enough I could get my handlebars to move further away from me um, <laughs> and I actually broke broke the seat clamp uh, trying to tighten it enough that it wouldn't rotate as I hopped onto the bike I have those sorts of issues been so and then the other the other concern i had about it which i think in the end up that actually happened was with the placement for the the uh, cable inputs for the coming from the levers being directly below the stem it seemed like a pretty bad place for like sweat ingress and 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 that and have, have those issues sort of been addressed with this I, I mean going to a cheaper bike i wouldn't think Absolutely. so the clamps okay. have been redesigned uh, i haven't slipped those out yet carbon paste is also your friend indoors for these kind of things um and what you mentioned the connector is has changed for the better would be debatable because now it's this little magneto connector 
just below the stem, hooks under like you know the old school DI2 uh, junction box that used to have a um, little rubber band over to the stem. Very, very similar to that. The magnets are kind of strong, but it's in a really weird spot. If you throw a towel over the bike, the connector may come loose and the bike completely shuts off. Ask me how I know. I, I troubleshooted that for about 10 minutes, like the power pack's out, this, I've changed this, what's oh, going on, the power pack's live, what's, yeah. and it was just a little bit off. So Wahoo have taken that feedback on board from, uh, from us who have had early units and are uh, looking into that. I've put a little rubber band around it and it hasn't dropped out, um, but they have addressed that. Um, sweat proofing for that should be fine. I'm just trying to think. I'd, if you've got a good enough fan, you shouldn't be sweating straight down. You should be sweating behind you with a good fan. In, in theory, <laughs> have, yeah. I have you I, seen? Have you seen what I do on the turbo? <laughs> 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 the, the fan is not turned on. What? No, I mean, <laughs> gotta have a fan. Well, yeah. What? Oh. Ronan, Ronan's been known to wear a full body suit on indoors. A, a painter suit. Yeah. He, he <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Huh. Wow. I'm, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> related to that question, Shane, I actually asked them about the corrosion thing specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and more specifically, I asked them about like hardware coatings and materials and that sort of thing. So I was really kind of hoping that they would have moved all the hardware to stainless um, for that reason. But apparently it's not all stainless. It, it, it is a mix of stuff. Um, so they're saying it's a mix of chrome plated and stainless and like the stem bolts are coated steel, leg bolts are steel, but they're also coated. Um, and I guess that's pretty good in a sense that they're coated or galvanized or whatever, but, um, just seeing and knowing how some of these things have gone over the last couple of years that these have been out, um, you know, I feel like companies always need to account for the worst case scenario. And I don't know if I see that here. Like I really, like, again, I really do wish that all that, all that hardware was stainless. Yeah. I uh, personally, I coat everything with Shield T9, uh, which is a corrosion pro prohibitor. Um, hot tip from Rao Lucia from Lucia Tech on that one. Um, if I'm sweating on anything, but yeah, I have seen some really, really nasty things indoors with sweat. Um, it would be nice if it was, let's say coated with something like that, if they're not using those certain materials, um, but uh, is what it is. Mm. Any thoughts Bummer. on the steel frame? Is it pretty well protected? Oh, I've only had it for two weeks. Um, I'll let you know in four or five weeks. Um, and it's coming up to summer. So I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I'm in Ballarat. So yeah, I guess I'll be riding it all year round. It's cold here. <laughs> Time <laughs> cold, <tell>. Rel relatively. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I guess sticking to the indoor theme, do we have any news on Zwift? Because uh, they announced a little bit of an expansion recently, right? Uh, this week, oh, sorry, not this week, this season in Zwift, I think media release is coming out in the next few days or has been released. Um, yeah, Watopia expansion, that's all I've got my eyes on. People love Watopia. It's the home for a lot of people, a lot of hardcore Zwifters, and uh, any new roads on Watopia do well. So there'll be a few new routes, route badges, and things coming up, uh, and a few other announcements uh, coming up this season as well as things ramp up into, well, it's indoor season regardless of where you are in the world. Um, so, yeah, it should be interesting to see. Yeah, so. Yeah, they've got some changes to like race categorization and, mm. and stuff like that. Um, some new like steering features. Um, nothing super crazy, but if you're if you're a hardcore Zwifter, you're probably already aware of this stuff anyway. So we don't really have to run through any of that. Ron, was there anything that you saw that you are intrigued about uh, or, or keen to try? The out? new the new Zwift racing score. I I have seen that. I've read about it, but I want to look into it a bit more. Uh, it's not actually replacing like the pace group categories. Uh, I think at least initially anyway is going to sit alongside them and it's kind of a new way to measure well measure progress while also providing sort of um, according to Zwift like an incentive to improve your I think they call it Zwift racing skills um, but it's sort of combining power your, well your your power for a race uh, your final race result it's measuring skills somehow um, and then your score is updated automatically after each race and sort of, uh, again, factoring in your final finishing position, but also the strength of the field. So like the, uh, presumably that means that how many other riders and the, the, the level of those riders in the race will, you know, will weight different races and results, uh, as such. So that seems to me to be quite interesting. Um, but as I said, I need to kind of need to look into it a bit more. Maybe the skills uh, uh, is where the new kicker move comes in, and it's actually secretly measuring <laughs> how how well you balance on the bike. Uh, Who knows? Maybe. Yeah. Mm, definitely not. Anyway. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Shane. 
Shane, thanks so much for chiming in here. Always appreciate having you on. It's been a pleasure. We'll no have worries, you. Guys. Thank you. I mean, we'll make sure to have you on the next time. We've got some more fun stuff to talk about. Absolutely. Chat soon, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cool. Thanks, Shane. Cheers, Shane. All right. Another bike that actually came out pretty recently that I, for, sorry, I forgot to mention in the intro to this episode. Uh, we've got a new Ridley Falcon RS, uh, new kind of all round aero road bike from Ridley. Rodin, this is a bike that you reviewed. What are we looking at? Uh, yeah, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. An, an all round sort of aero light, as I like to call them, uh, race bike from Ridley. It, it is very much a, a race bike. It does have clearance for 34 mil tires, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head. But um, yeah, it, it's replacing Ridley's helium climbing bike. And where that bike, according to Ridley, was very much focused on stiffness to weight, this is focused on aero to weight. So Ridley have focused their attention on keeping the weight as low as possible while also improving the aerodynamic characteristics of this bike. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a bike that's kind of struck me, to be honest with you. I, I've taken quite a liking to it. Um, the only thing I didn't quite like about it was the price, which was uh, unfortunately very high. Uh, I think Ridley had a, a, a real... Um, I don't know. the the only the only word coming to mind here is game changer, but that's because it's late at night, and that's not really the word I want to use. But they had a, they had a they had a very good and compelling bike in their hands, but the pricing is going to put it out of a lot of people's reach, unfortunately. Uh, and there there is also just very few build options. Um, I've had a com- well, I haven't had a confirmed since, but I understand since that there is a frame only option, which which may help. But um, yeah, that was a bike I reviewed. The full review is on the website as of last week. There was a well, there was an immediate embargo on that bike because it last Friday coincided with uh, Ridley CEO's birthday. Um, so they said they normally launch bikes on a Thursday, but he decided he wanted to announce this one the day later on his birthday, which I guess he gets to do because he owns the company. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Um, that's one way to ensure that your team's unavailable on your birthday is to <laughs> keep them all busy with like <laughs> answering questions and uh. oh man uh yeah regarding that pricing Ronan I mean so I guess I, I I think overall the bike strikes me as being pretty good and, and as you said you you seem like you like it quite a bit um but the pricing is pretty outlandish so uh, in the U S I think you had said that it was like 12,000 U S for the bike that you tested, which 12 and a half, uh, well, 12,400. And that was with Altegra DI2, if I remember correctly. Right. Yes. Um, and in comparison, so that giant defy SL zero, uh, that defy advanced SL zero that, that I, I just reviewed on the site. Um, that thing comes with. SRAM red axis with a power meter with the KDX carbon spoked wheels. It's super light, so on and so forth. And that is actually cheaper oh than my. this bike because it's tw- it's 12,000. And you get a lot more head tube with it as well. <laughs> you get a lot more head tube. <laughs> a, yes. lot the, a lot. This is the opposite of the geometries we were talking about at the start of this uh, podcast. Uh, this is mm. very, very long and low. Um, yes. James, but there's something very strange going on with the US pricing there. Uh, I did double check it with Ridley before publishing that article and just got confirmation that the the, the numerical figures that I had were accurate and uh, mm. didn't really get any explanation as to why it's so much more expensive in US. I mean, like it's expensive in the UK and European markets, but it's just at another level entirely. Right. Like the, the exchanges aren't even nearly in the same ballpark. Yeah, it'd be, uh, so it'd there's, be there's going through else. a distributor that isn't necessarily focused on running a global pricing. Mm. Um, but uh, in in Europe, how does it have you compared it to any other similar race bikes um, in terms of pricing? I I did at the time. Um, I mentioned a couple in the article. Let me just uh, refresh my memory. Uh, the one, if I remember correctly, now the one that surprised me most was that. Um, well, I shouldn't really say it surprised me most, but just that it was more expensive than the US L8 sort of caught me by surprise. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, for, that's, for a that's kind of what build. I was I was wondering because I'd say like the Trek Madone and the the Tarmac SL8 are probably 
in my mind, kind of like the benchmark of pricing in a sense. Like that's, you know, they they sit at the very top end and there's not, you know, you sort of then have to look at a dogma or something like that to spend more. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I kind of consider those to be ex pricey options. So if, if it's more than that, then then I think that tells me everything I need to know. Yeah, some of the equipped specialist time, I guess, Elite is six hundred pound less expensive. I was very purposely not saying six hundred pound cheaper there, but six hundred pound less expensive uh, yeah, okay. than the new Falcon RS. So yeah. six hundred pound is a heck of a lot of money. Yeah, okay. um, yeah even at these lofty numbers. Yeah, that is a premium bike. Um, the the thing that sort of struck me over and over again about this bike was just. Um, and I mean, I mean this in a positive way, but just how th there was there was no like standout features, or there was no uh, you know overly uh, th there was no hole in the seat tube, there was no speed sniffer, there was nothing you know out outlandish about it. It was just a solid all round bike, and I think that could be mistaken for um for just a tick box in Ridley. Everybody's doing an all road bike. We're going to do an all road bike. Um, but it, it very clearly was not that, um, there, there was Ridley did talk some about the, the, the four crown diffuser, uh, which basically just less more space between the tire and the, the four crown. But, uh, that, that was as far as it went in terms of, um, sort of marketing hype or, or whatever you want to call that. But, um, I think, I think just, the bike is all the better for that. I just wonder if the bike may suffer for that in terms of sales, because uh, as much as half the internet likes to hate on stuff like that, the other half of the internet seems to enjoy stuff like that. So, um, mm. well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Okay. Thing. Huh. Well, either way, head over to escapecollective.com and check out that review. All right, last bit of tech news today. Uh, this one comes from MIPS, actually. Uh, they've got a new computer-based virtual test lab. That, that's capital V, capital T, capital L, of course. Uh, and that is being made available to MIPS uh, brand partners. And they're saying it's a way to accelerate helmet development and testing. And certification is still done with physical samples, of course. Uh, so in the press release that we got, it says, quote, through our virtual test lab, we are revolutionizing helmet, helmet testing by harnessing the power of advanced computer science. This innovative approach not only accelerates development timelines, but also embodies our commitment to sustainability and environmental responsibility. MIPS continues to lead the way in shaping the future of helmet-based safety, unquote. Uh, I think overall, this sounds like kind of a neat development with helmet testing. Uh, just the idea that you maybe don't have to produce as many physical samples as you're kind of going through the whole development process. Uh, I don't really, I, I haven't spoken to any of MIPS's brand partners or anything, so I don't really know how effective or kind of reliable or accurate this thing is, but uh, kind of a neat little thing, neat little tidbit that landed in my inbox regardless. Do we know of anyone else doing similar? Not that I know of. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's certainly possible, but certainly no one has sent out a press release on it. So uh whether or not MIPS is the only company doing this sort of thing, I do think it's a neat development just in the sense that, uh, yeah, I mean, if it leads to, well, if it's just a bunch of marketing hype, then that's kind of a bummer. Um, but if it does actually lead to safer and better helmets that come about on a quicker timeline, then I'm all for it. Sign, sign me up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. More, more testing facilities and more uh, capability um, in the market is not a bad thing. So, Yeah. Not bad at all. So we'll see where this goes. I suspect we'll hear more. Just before you move on, James, I just want to bring one thing to the attention of uh, the other track or aero nerds who may be out there listening. Uh, Dave and I had a conversation about this time last year with Dan Bigham just after he broke the air record. And we briefly discussed on that podcast how great it would be to have like a day of our records or and our records world championship or something like that. Uh, and I'm not going to take any, I don't think we're going to take any credit for that, but just fast forward a year and uh, this Friday. So hopefully just before, just after you're listening to this podcast, watch up our hosting their watch up week of records in Grenchen Velodrome. And there's actually five R record attempts on Friday. Um, I don't think there's any way to watch these R records other than just through watch up's own Instagram account, which and reliably informed will be manned by Dan Bigham himself on Friday. Um, but yeah, there's there, and there's a couple of there's a couple of quite 
big attempts here. The, the, both the U.S. and the French national R records are uh, are going to be attempted on on Friday. So, um, for anybody who's into the R records, we it's few and far between, and, and very very seldom that we actually get to see anybody attempt one. So, uh, you may well see five attempts on Friday. I assume no one quite going for Ghana's record. Well, I mean, I guess technically speaking. Um, they may eclipse it, but uh, probably unlikely. Uh, yeah. They're going to ride for an hour. They're going to go as far as they can. I, I doubt anybody is going to go quite as far as Ghana. There's yeah. there's there's kind of a whole package that Watch Up have been offering. So they like offering equipment optimization. Uh, obviously, all the training and all behind attempting the record, um, testing on track, uh, establishing like warm up and cooling protocols, and yeah, they're 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 actually kind of giving the whole. Ghana treatment, even if you're not going for Ghana's distance. Interesting. I think. Interesting. Mm. Well, I guess we know what's on your mind this week then. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I guess, yeah, that's going to wrap up our new segment. So, Ronan, is that what you got on your mind? Uh, I have quite a lot on my mind, um, given that it's been six weeks since I've been on the podcast. Um, so, let's, I'm not let's, sure. If... Let's get some of it out there. How about just one? Uh, I think the one that's most fresh in my mind is just, you know, having reviewed that Ridley last week, um, all the talk of do it all bikes. And I'm just kind of wondering in 2023, why the UCI weight limit has not changed in so long. It's still at 6.8 kilos uh, and all the advancements we've break. made in carbon technology and yeah, big disc break, um, and aerodynamic advancements and all that. <laughs> Surely anything other than a dedicated aero bike isn't, if it's a performance race bike that, like that Ridley is, it's not an all-rounder bike. It's just, a, that is a climbing bike these days. Um, and if it's not at 6.8 kilos for the pros, then is that just a heavy climbing bike? I, I, I just, I get the extra tire clearance and all that, but I'm sort of, I find myself wondering time and time again, if this thing was 6.8 kilos, you know, that's as light as it can be for the pros anyway. So, you know, is that, is that just what a climbing bike is now? And climbing bikes should have all the aero features that, that do it all bikes as we're calling them have now. So yeah, that, that I was kind of finding myself wondering that time and time again. I mean, I guess the argument is that, while you could certainly pretty easily make a bike that is quite a bit lighter now, even you know, even just looking, you know, even disregarding the UCI weight limit, um, I guess the argument that brands keep putting forward is that um, a climbing bike that is 6.8 kilos as opposed to 6.5, theoretically, would probably still be faster if it incorporates some aero elements than a lighter bike that doesn't, right? I mean, I guess that, that's... That's what they keep saying anyway, right? But uh, that's um, very much what Ridley were saying with the helium, the old helium versus the new Falcon. There's 110 grams or whatever it is difference between them, uh, you know, and, and that that kind of gets to my point as well. So if there's only 110 grams between the dedicated climbing bike and the do it all aero and lightweight bike, yeah, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm just in my in my mind, these are now the new climbing bikes. Um, I'm not saying that's right. Uh, obviously, if I was building a bike for a hill climb or an Everesting or a non-UCI event, I would want it to be a heck of a lot lighter than 6.8. But so long as we're stuck to that number, um, these are our climbing bikes. They're not do-it-all bikes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it, this keeps coming back to something that we've talked about God knows how many times on this on this podcast or previous podcast or whatever. Um, just the idea that so much of development work, particularly in the road bike space, is kind of constrained by UCI guidelines. Um, yeah, I think it's great that companies are, I guess, progressively making bikes that are more and more, you know, they perform better in some way at that same weight limit. Um, but at the same time, for people who don't care at all about a 6.8 kilo bike or being UCI legal and whatever, um, you know, would they have more fun? Would they, would, they, would the riding be more enjoyable for them if they were on a bike that's six kilos? Um, yeah, I guess there, there's not really a whole lot of selection out there for like ultra, ultra lightweight bikes. And I guess it also begs the question of how, and I think we've asked this before, like how much lighter can the bikes get anyway? Um, and I don't know, maybe that's a subject for another show moving forward. Well, I think it's 
you know, to give frame manufacturers a credit, I think with the likes of, well, the Athos or that new O2 VAM or whatever, I think frames, I'm not sure any of us want to see them getting any lighter than that. Yeah. Um, so no. I, well, that, I think that's it's, what I'm wondering. Like, how much lighter yeah. could they get anyway? We arguably want them more durable and resilient to, to damage in, in the event of an accident rather than to be 50 grams lighter. Or, I mean, uh, maybe focused on recyclable and even more so than durable or whatever like um but anyway that's a entirely different topic but uh i think it's very much over to group set manufacturers finished kit manufacturers wheel manufacturers if you know if we if we really want to get the weights down further and stick with disc brakes and the likes um but i, I think it's just the i think part of what struck me was it's the this bike is the do it all bike um and the talk about lightweight but you know the fact that it's actually designed for their world tour teams and the those teams being restricted to 6.8 kilos in a way was sort of where the where the um the struggle came in for me yep i hear you i mean unfortunately that's just i guess that's kind of just where we're at so in, until until more bike brands are willing to just sort of ignore UCI guidelines and just make whatever they, they think people will want to buy as opposed to what the UCI will allow that that's that's what we got Ronin, i guess continuing to move things out of your brain that have been accumulating over the last six weeks uh one i think uh why don't we why don't we well, why don't you do our psa for this week too and maybe move, move that little bit of info out of your out of your files there yeah my psa is just around um being overly reliant on the maps on our head units uh specifically for you know, if, if we're going down a descent that we maybe don't know all that well, uh, because thankfully I was descending a, a descent that I do know very well. Uh, well, it's a few weeks ago now. Um, it's actually, it could be a couple of months ago now at this point, but I I happen to know that there is actually a incredibly sharp S-bend midway down the descent. Um, and so it was breaking up for it, but my head unit also happened to be on the maps page and my head unit was sort of showing that the road went pretty much straight on, um, which kind of scared me at the time. So uh, I went back another day just to double check it and had the same results. So uh, I don't know how widespread this is. I it's 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 only this one road that I've seen it on, but it's just sort of a reminder that you know if if we are solely relying on those for determining how fast we can take a corner, um, just err on the side of caution. My mm. my initial thought when you said that was um, that's a lot of things that you're doing, adjusting your cleats and looking at your head unit while descending. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I I stop to adjust my cleats these days. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Good to hear, Ronan. Good to hear. You know, we just got you back after a long break, so we'd prefer not to lose you again to, for another reason. So, mm. stay upright, please. Yeah. I, I I actually have to say I don't think I've ever descended. No, nah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, okay. I think I have descended looking at the map, but it's definitely not a common thing. I I tend to rather read the road ahead. I was yeah. I I definitely have not done that. Like I I, I feel like I am inherently skeptical of things like that. Mm. Yeah, I, I know it is. It's by no means common practice, but it certainly happens that yeah riders will um and I've. I'm pretty sure I've done it myself in the past uh, on a foreign descent or something where I didn't know it. And more so as like a, a, a double checking what the corner looked like it was about to do. Or, you know, if you couldn't see, is that a 90 degree or is that a hairpin? Um, sure. that those sorts of questions. Yeah. Um, but, but if you think about it, like the, the amount of descending that the, the Vuelta is happening right now. The amount of descending that the riders will do in the Vuelta, and they are not going to know, know the majority of those roads. Yeah. Um. I know a lot of pros will flick to the map screen, um, before they get to the top of a climb, just for that very reason. Um, yeah. Interesting. And and historically, a lot of pros have used much larger computers than you would uh, assume they would need, which would exp you know that would be the reason mm. for it is to have that sort of data in front of them. Um, could well you be know, yeah. visible maps so um but yeah it's certainly like yeah I, I don't doubt they're they're using it for for similar reasons but um, i i yeah. would uh i would like well i don't know if i'd like but I, I would be interested to hear if anybody else has seen the same thing where the 
the the road on your head unit didn't match the trajectory of the road in in real life. Um, so yeah, let me let me know if that's if anybody else has noticed that. Mm. I'm, I'm I'm really hoping it's just like some glitch on the small back road uh, in Ireland rather than something that maybe could happen elsewhere. Or maybe you just found some sort of wormhole in the time space continuum. <laughs> <laughs> this place doesn't look a bit like that might be the case <laughs> all right well we're going we're gonna go ahead and close on that that'll do it for this week's episode of geek warning before we wrap up just another quick reminder to people listening to this show if you have not yet signed up for an escape collective membership please go ahead and do so you can do so at uh, escapecollective.com slash join uh so you, we don't run any ads on the show uh, and that means everything that we do here is funded by our members if you become a member of escape collective that gets you full access to all of our content uh access to our members only discord channel um and uh maybe some exclusive podcast content moving forward uh, we've got monthly and annual options available starting at just, uh, I think, seven bucks a month U.S. So hopefully you can make some room in your budget for us to support what we're doing here. Yeah, uh, it's worth uh, mentioning that there are two tiers as well. We've got readers and then there's there's members. So the readers gets you behind the paywall, gets you access to all of our content, including perhaps some special content still to come. Uh, and yeah, the membership side, side of things gets you access to the community. So that's where discord is and where you'll find gp llama hanging out and the likes of raul lucia as well which is a very good place to ask a tech question uh, dave i'm glad that you pay closer attention to our edit meetings than i do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway thanks as always for listening make sure you head over to itunes and leave us a rating or review that is also very helpful uh and in the meantime uh that'll do it for this week's episode of geek, geek warning thanks as always for listening and we'll see you next week thank you